You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I'm David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests. And as a reminder, my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network, and it's available on Apple, Spotify, and Google, and anywhere else where podcasts are available. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. And also, as a reminder, I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching, and you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com. Or as you can see on the Zoom link, thatgratitudeguypodcast.com as well. So let me get on with the show and introduce my guests. It's always my favorite part of the show. I have some other material from time to time, but the guest is the primary focus from week to week because I do this on a weekly basis. And uh, my guest t- this morning, or today, I should say, is Nick Aguirre, aka Nick Gnosis, who's an expert in subconscious reprogramming. He is the founder of Apex Mind Coaching, a company that helps elite performers program their subconscious minds for success. Nick uses hypnosis, neuro-linguistic programming, and other modalities to help leaders and salespeople manage their stress, break through limitations, and reach consistent peak performance. Nick Aguirre, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. You bet. And I'm going to be anxious to hear about uh, some of this the NLP and some of the different things you do in the mm-hmm. modalities, as you mentioned, which I think will, will be really fascinating for a lot of people. But I kind of like to start with a couple of the, the same questions I do from week to week. Tell the listeners and the viewers how you and I met. Sure. We met through a mutual friend, Ellen Melko Moore, uh, who's a fantastic uh, LinkedIn coach and business strategist. And um, I think where we we kind of hit it off and had a lot of commonality was in our love of uh, public speaking. So that's uh, that's that is where we met. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And I was thinking too a a, a, a word that I use a lot with in a case like that the mastermind where you and I met and certainly no exception with you and me is like minded people. You just meet people that want to do do things. They want to make a difference. And there's a lot of, I managed a lot of people in my life. And um, there's a lot of people that just don't have much motivation and they don't have much to motivate themselves, much less anybody else. So, so let's, let's go backwards in time a little bit and talk about not so much the growing up, but maybe high school, college and that kind of thing. And kind of how Nick started out and maybe your direction when you first started out in life in the work world. Sure. I would love to do that. So I'd say one of the biggest challenges that I ever had was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, I'm going to brag on myself a little bit here, but um, I have a a pretty wide array of aptitudes. I've been good at the kind of the left brain stuff, computer science analysis, data, and uh, the right side as well, more of the the creative uh, endeavors. And this put me in a weird spot when I was in college. So I changed my major about five different times. And I never felt like I was good at any of those things. But you know, the teachers would would tell me so. So it puts you in a weird spot, I could be a sociologist an anthropologist, I could do finance, uh, economics, I could do um, digital media, I could do almost almost anything at that at that point. And I remembered a very vivid moment, actually, I had a professor this is about, I don't know, 2008 or so. I told him, I don't know what, I, I sw- he's like, you're switching your major again? What happened? He said, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And he said, Nick, I'm 41 and I'm not sure either. When I figure it out, I'll let you know. <laughs> so I remember that conversation, an exchange like that you just never forget. 
So I spent a lot of my 20s kind of wandering around and, um, you know, I have a degree in finance. I have my master's of fine arts in interactive media. So that's a terminal degree. And probably the big stepping stone that I got was in my mid 20s became a, a professor. And um, the cool thing about doing the, the MFA route is you don't have to become a doctor or anything like that. You can, you can just get that terminal degree and start teaching, which is, which is awesome. And um, I really liked being a lecturer. I liked, uh, I, I love public speaking. I love being in front of audiences and I loved um, being with the kids. Uh, they're super motivated. They're awesome. They're fantastic. And there is still an element missing. I didn't really want to talk to people about, you know, how to build a web page or how to make, a, you know, graphic design and stuff like that. I, I was kind of looking for the other side of communications, the more uh, intimate and more personal growth side of it. So the cool thing about being a teacher at the college level is you're generally teaching fall and spring, which means winter and summer you can travel. And that's exactly what I did. <clears throat> so I'd save up all year and I'd go on adventures. And you don't make a ton of money as a professor, but you live comfortably. And um, if you're frugal, even more so. So I kind of, I would explore and I'd learn things. I'd do I, I'm someone who never stopped learning, and I'm always a, a student before a teacher. So I would go to conferences and conventions. I do all these things. I take classes in uh, improv, comedy, um, voice lessons, and uh, going to the personal growth seminars and things like that. And I really discovered that there was a passion there, but I wasn't sure how to apply it. So you, you fast forward a bit, and how did I get into all this? How did I get to doing what I'm doing now. So I was still lecturing, but um, about three years ago, I was at a conference and uh, this was for social media marketing, you know, grow your audience, build your list. Here's how to do content. It's pretty cool. But they said, um, we have something a little different tonight. We have a late show and tonight there's going to be a hypnotist. And I thought that was bizarre. It was in Las Vegas, so it was a little bit fitting, but it's kind of like, that's weird. It seemed kind of left field for me. Um, but I thought, you know, what the heck, I'll check it out. I almost didn't go. and My life would be different if I decided to go back to the hotel. I said, what? I'm not doing anything. Let's check it out. Hypnosis. Is that real? Well, it can't be. I mean, that's got to be, you see that in, you know, movies and stuff, and that's it's got to be like a like a trick or a performance or something or it's uh, but whatever i want to see if i can watch this thing and figure out how they how they do this elaborate thing to you know put it together because i was very certain i was very certain that there was no such thing that this was some voodoo mm -hmm. and in my mind the way i equated hypnosis i kind of categorized this the same place that you would with psychics and uh, astrology and you know, a lot of things of that nature that, that I kind of regarded as, you know, at best a pseudoscience or it's this or that. Not knowing it's, you know, used by American uh, Dental Association and it's used by a lot of uh, renowned doctors and, and uh, is a, has a subject of a lot of research activity. Um, I, I didn't know all that. You, you just kind of draw conclusions, but I checked it out. And uh, this, this was a performance that changed my life forever. So I actually volunteered to be hypnotized because uh, I kind of wanted to see. And truth be told, um, as soon as things started getting going, I actually got a little bit nervous because there was part of me was like, well, what if this is real? <laughs> you're about to get hypnotized and you know, you're about to you know, be, lose control in front of a whole bunch of people, or at least that's what I thought. And um, the, the guy, he asked me to sit down because he, you know, he, at the time I was a little too nervous and I couldn't let go. You could tell by people's body posture and, and their breathing and whatnot, how on board they are. So you want to take people out of the picture if you think they're going to be an issue or you think they're not serious about doing it. Right. So he asked me to sit back down and I was a little bummed out, but I got to observe, which was something that's very strange. So this was like seeing, uh, you know, a sorcerer or seeing a magic in real life. And it was very bizarre. So the immediate thing in, in a stage hypnosis show, what you start to think is, are these people pretending? Are these people acting? They must be playing along. 
So I started to see several indicators that that probably wasn't the case. So the, one of the suggestions given is, um, it was a few things that convinced me. One, one was um, first and foremost, the, the movements of the people. They, if you've seen someone who's deeply hypnotized, they have a, this ironed out expression in the face, kind of a glazed over thing where it doesn't look like they're fully there. Um, as if you've just like kind of woken someone up and they're, some of their motor movements of their hand and stuff is, it, it looks unusual. It just, it's something was different. And I was like, that state is on everyone. I can see on their faces, something's different here. I don't think these people are acting. Mm. And what, what, and the next thing was, um, you know, this person's job is to entertain. So it's not necessarily hitting a therapist. This guy is more of an entertainer, right? A different job. So he, he gives suggestions to all the participants. And he says, I'm going to give you all a number. One, two, three, four, five. Odd numbers. The next time you open your eyes, you are watching the funniest movie you've ever seen in your entire life. Even numbers. Next time you open your eyes, you're watching the saddest, most tragic film you've ever seen. So everyone opens their eyes and it's hysterical. So you have, there's people who are crying, people who are laughing, like, like rolling over laughing, people who are, are crying and they're not acting. You know, you can't just, an ordinary person who's, unless they're, they're not trained actors, there's no way that you can produce that, that emotional intensity just at will like that. There's no way. And you look at people's faces and just like, my God, th this is real. Like they're really, they're, they're really with this right now. And so David, what really put, what really put the nail in the coffin for me was uh, the most bizarre thing I've ever seen in my entire life. But there, there's a man and a woman there. The man is hypnotized and his, uh, his girl's in the audience. So the hypnotist approaches her and says, is this your husband? She says, no my boyfriend he says okay how long have you guys been together she says about four years and he says hmm okay how come he hasn't asked you the big question yet what's going on there and she says i i don't know maybe just not the right time yet and the, maybe it's the money and i don't know and he goes hmm okay tell you what how do you want me to fix this i'll fix it for you right now and she says oh my god yes and i'm thinking there's there's no way like there's no way so i'm just kind of like in disbelief already and he approaches the man and he puts his hands on him he says something to him in his ear and immediately this guy who i met earlier that week the man stands up and he was pretty um reserved and and pretty soft-spoken but in this state he with no hesitation or inhibition he addresses the entire room uh you know professing his love to this woman and proposes to her in this weird um, kind of um, tranced out state. And she, she's hysterical. She's, you know, beat red. She's crying. I've never seen a human being that happy in my entire life. And this whole thing, it sounds like something you would see in a, in a movie or something, or it sounds, it sounds unreal. It's happening before my eyes. And I'm just like, I'm shocked. Like I'm, I am taken aback. Um, <clears throat> experience to me was as if you didn't believe in lightning and then one day you were struck dead by a bolt of lightning mm. that's what i saw here so this was like oh. a portal that was taken through and i could not sleep that night i was obsessed in my mind always kept going back to it it's like this black hole that just pulled me into it so that was my obsession with hypnosis and that that gave me um you know that combined with my other tools of public speaking of um just learning general communication skills, proved to be pretty good at it. So where I naturally found a niche with hypnotherapy was in working with leaders because a lot of them had the same problems and I could identif identify as a business owner. So there seemed to be a natural need and there's all these this or that coaches, mindset coaches, you know, self-improvement, this or that. Well, I found myself actually having a, you know, an edge with this tool set that most people didn't have access to. And um, that's where I was really able to, to carve out a nice little spot for myself in the market. And Nick, how long ago was that with the, the Las Vegas experience? It's about three years. Oh, so it's in relatively recently because it's interesting. You were talking about the 41 year old professor and, and left side and right side and, you know, challenge not knowing what I want to do. And 
I always think it's interesting because when we're kids, you know, we think, what do you want to do when you grow up? At least my generation, that's what we were always asked. And then it's taken further when you meet somebody, Nick, Dave, Dave, Nick, hi, what do you do? You know, it's always this thing about what do you do and how we attach that. So, so by the way, I was going to ask you back in the lecturing world, what did you lecture about? Because I was, wasn't that in uh, Minnesota? Close. It was in Indiana. Indiana. Uh, Yeah. So, so I I taught at uh, Indiana University, fantastic school. And this was the media school. So it was communications or the telecom side of um, web design was what I was renowned for. Uh, Did some other forms of, of uh, digital media, like graphic design, uh, user interface. There's a lot about my job was essentially to make the world of uh, tech and, um, and the world of these digital interfaces accessible to people who are not very technical. Excellent. And I think too, the right side, it's rare that you see somebody who explores both sides of their brain. I think it doesn't take long to figure out which side of their brain is the one that they're going to gravitate for, towards, but it's rare to see somebody that has sort of both sides. And I've thought about that with the, maybe the Steve Jobs or the Bill Gates or some of these people that are well known that seem to have the creative side and the analytical side, uh, at least how I see it, the right and left brain. But uh, before we get, I want to get on to the more about the hypnotist, hypnotherapy as sure. well. Uh, but before we get there, I'm curious on, the, I love the travel, work in the fall and winter, travel the spring and summer. What, what did some of those adventures teach you or educate you on or get you uh, able to access that were so cool that you think about that really are in your top couple three? Sure. So first, there, I want to talk about the impetus for this, which was um, <clears throat> that I had this attitude of, first, I'm going to get successful, then I'm going to live my life. Mm-hmm. And so it hit me about age 27, 28. I was like, oh, my goodness, I'm about to be 30. And I haven't, you know, lived, I haven't been outside of, you know, um, America, and I haven't done this or that. And I've never, you know, really been in love. And I don't never been to this place. And everyone's saying, Oh, you have to go see this thing. So that was a big part of it was the feeling of urgency. And that, oh, there's never going to be a good time to do this. I just got to do it. And um, playing it safe. That's the point where I said, you know what, screw it. I've kind of played it safe a lot. And um, People avoid risks, but playing it safe is a humongous risk. You're going to lose everything if you if you always do that. Nothing changes. Um, <clears throat> so that was the impetus for this. And to, to answer your question, what are some of the top three? Well, one of the coolest ones, and I'm so grateful to the university for this, was um, we, we had a... a an exchange course, basically, where these game design students were going to Japan. And, um, you know, I I had taught some of the game design courses, and I spoke a little Japanese. So I was a pretty good fit to to be the field assistant. So, you know, so, you know, we're talking about gratitude here today, I am infinitely grateful for getting paid (laughs) to go to Japan Mm -hmm. uh, for like 10 days. That was amazing. And, um, the culture is remarkable there. And the coolest thing was probably, you know, living in, in the US, you've got trash cans every four feet and people still throw crap on the ground. In Japan, the, the garbage cans, at least where I was, were spaced maybe every bl- other block or every couple of blocks. And you didn't see garbage anywhere. Wow. Wow. Nowhere. Yeah. And um, the the observation of uh, respect and consideration and um, mm. kind of an old fashioned chivalry was remarkable. And um, not only that, but but you tend to think of the culture as being sort of homogenous, but it was very different in in Japan. Some areas they love foreigners; they speak English. Come on in. The signs have Japanese and English. Other areas have not just Japanese, but like traditional old school Japanese. Um, and say, you know, what they say, uh, gaijin deki nai, or no, no foreigners allowed or whatever it said, you know, um, no, <laughs> so, so even within the same country, you'd see a remarkable, um, different spectrum of, of, uh, mm. of people and, and experiences. So that was Japan. That was amazing. And, um, next would probably be Las Vegas. And I'd gone there a couple of times. I'd gone there for Adobe Max conference. I'd gone there for the, um, that social media convention that I mentioned. Um, 
And I was very reserved and, and shy, <clears throat> kind of identified as, as being an introvert and um, wasn't, wasn't super good with a lot of my social skills. But, you know, I, I made a point to, I did a long trip to Las Vegas and there was a couple of workshops and stuff there and spent about 17 days there. And I really made the point to be more gregarious and more, uh, you know, social. So set out with a mission to like, you know, talk to at least 10 or 20 people a day, the, you know, cocktail waitresses, people playing slot machines, blackjack dealers, um, people at the mall, and this really took time to overcome that. And a lot of people identify as having certain limitations. And the question I'd ask is, is it possible that that's just a behavior change or habit mm -hmm. that maybe you're not actually so-called introverted or shy that maybe you just have a habit of behaving as such. Yeah. And I, I kind of made myself the, the experiment here. And what I found was, yeah, if you do that behavior enough, you can produce extroversion. If you, it, it becomes a muscle that you learn to do that. And when you see, Hey, not, not everyone is going to, uh, you know, hate you because you ask them what time it is or, you know, a lot of people are more friendly than you thought. And a lot of people are more welcoming. And, um, you know, I started to, to form a lot of my charisma and a lot of confidence in just going on that mission of uh, just talking to as many people as I could have. So in just about two weeks, I pretty much, you know, permanently overcame that, that fear. Wow. And that's setting the intention too, which I think is really good. I, I think sure. it's like asking the right questions. I think some people don't even ask the right question or ask a question and then they're kind of stuck so to ask the question is fantastic that's half the battle and then to answer it so your answer was let me get out here and meet more people and so forth so if we if we roll back to the this this career path and we think about the university of indiana and then going on and seeing this person in vegas and and witnessing that event and so forth uh what do you remember kind of when the brain it kind of went that sort of from the left side, to not the left side, right side of the brain, but just the, the, sw the switch kind of flipped. And you said, I think I'm going to do this for a living. Do you remember how that kind of came about? Yeah, I think on a subconscious level, it happened immediately. I mm -hmm. think in the back of my mind, I, there was a part of me that said, that's the coolest thing ever. I want to learn to do that. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think that happened immediately. There was a fantasy element there. Um, but there's a, in my more logical mind, it's like, well, I have this kind of job. I'm a professor. You don't just, you don't just give that up mm -hmm. and well, you know, I don't, I don't know how to do that. Can I really learn? And the more I researched it, the more I realized it wasn't as difficult as I thought to, uh, become certified in hypnotherapy. There were a lot of options that were flexible, um, with my situation, and I did a year-long program. It's about a 500-hour program with um, about 200 of that being a practicum where you have to work on people, hypnotize people. And I'd done this. It's a year-long, but I did it in an entire summer. I did it because, like I said, I didn't teach. Very fortunately, very grateful for this. I didn't have to teach during winter and summer generally. So I did that entire course over a summer. Wow, that's cool. So was that like a a 40 hour a week thing or a 20 hour a week? How many, how much did you have to invest during that summer mm -hmm. to learn? Let me think. So I spent about four hours a day studying. So mm -hmm. this was watch reading uh, textbooks, case studies and videos. Um, you know, so I'd, I spent about four, let's see, what is that? So that's almost 30 hours just on the, the course material alone. And then I would try to schedule at least like one or two people a day. Um, I practice on any warm body I could find essentially. And, um, you know, found, found people and just people I knew and just said, here's what I'm doing. Um, and the, the more that it, that I did that, the more rewarding that was and, you know, became really compelling to do it. So yeah, it probably was about 40 hours a, a week or something like that. I'm trying to think that sounds about right. Yeah, at least that. I spent a ton of time, and and during this time, I was also working a lot on um, branding and and things of that nature for um, for the company. So yeah. So it's interesting too how that you know you mentioned earlier about uh, I don't know what I want to do in this forty one year old professor or person. I think it was a professor. 
left side, right side. And, and he said, he's not sure he knew what he wanted to do. And yet it was funny, you go to that episode or go to that demonstration or, or event and you kind of just change, this is what I'm going to do. And I think that's really cool. Sometimes I think it's, it's, I've told people before, you have to just allow the brain, you don't have to do anything, but it's neat if you allow the brain to decide for you and you can decide to turn left every day, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and you wake up Tuesday morning, I'm turning right. Well, what happened from Monday night to Tuesday morning? I don't know, but all of a sudden I'm turning right and just allow that process to happen. Because if we look at the times that you decided to stop being a professor in Indiana and then move down to Austin and things like that, you know, you might've been, you know, not sure for, and then one day you, that's, this is it now I'm doing it. And so we have to allow that that'll happen and things. And I want to get a little bit more into the actual hypnosis uh, itself uh, in the next five or 10 minutes, but I do, be, before I do that, I wanted to ask about, I love to do this where how we can benefit the experience that we had on the planet, people that are younger than us that are coming along. And I'd mm -hmm. love to hear a little bit. I don't like the word advice, but maybe some tips or thoughts or things that you might have for somebody coming along that's maybe followed Nick's path and not really sure what they wanted to do. And one of the things I wrote down, I love is no more playing it safe, but do mm -hmm. you have other little things you might say? This is, this would be some thoughts I'd give to somebody that's maybe gone down the path I went down. Sure. I have a lot to say on the subject. So the first thing that I see, I'd see this a lot as a, as a teacher that there seems to be a narrative that you got to know exactly what you want to do for the rest of your life by age 18 mm -hmm. or that, you know, or that by age 23, you have your bachelor's and now you've got your career and you're going to do, you know, engineering or whatever for the rest of your life. A very few things will be permanent. And I can't hardly think of anyone who's done exactly the same thing for their entire life, maybe right. same industry, you know, maybe they work in financial services, but they did all kinds of different positions in there. Um, the marketplace changes, the landscape changes, the demand for labor changes, technology changes, culture changes. You can't get certainty. Yeah, there's no such thing out there. So you have to pick something, try something, and you got to try a lot of different things. Expose yourself to all kinds of different things. And every time there's a spark there and you say, that's interesting. Anytime that you find yourself, you know, look at where do you spend your time when you're not being paid for it? When you're, you know, what do you like to do? And look around there and being flexible is great too. So sometimes people will say, uh, I want to be a musician. I want to be a rock star and be the best uh, guitarist of all time. There's a lot of people vying for that position, but you might say, well, okay, I've got this passion in music. Well, what else is there? There's their entertainment industry. There's lights and sounds for shows. There's people who book uh, those shows. There's people who look for talent. There's people who repair guitars. There's people who teach guitar. There's people who make handcrafted. You know, there's a million things to do that are kind of in that same constellation. So it's like, even if you didn't get exactly the thing, but maybe you, you have something to do with it that's kind of in that realm, that's a really good place to be. So having some degree of flexibility there uh, can can also be helpful. And um, you know, I this happened to me, where I said, uh, you know, in, in early twenties, I think it was like I want to be a game designer, and then I got into grad school. <clears throat> I said I want to do a game design. I think I'm pretty good at it, and I had to take this course where we made charts, uh, infographics, data visualization. And the professor approaches me and he says, you're good at this. This is what you're going to do. And I said, no, I want to make video games. He said, nope, infographics. Mm. And I said, I said, I want to do video games. He says, no, we're going to do this. I have this project for you. Here's what it pays. And I said, oh, okay, well, I want to do that. That He said one contract that would pay for a quarter of my private school uh, uh, grad classes. That's, um, I said, okay, maybe I can do that. You know, so then it's like, if you're a little flexible and um, you're responding not only to what you want, but to what the market wants, that's where you're, you're going to get it. Cause um, you, you have to serve people and everything that you do to make a living. So you, where's that sweet spot of I'm passionate about this and I care about it, but also, um, you know, th there's, there's a demand for it and there's a market for it. Let's see, what else do I have to say on that subject? Um, meeting people and um, 
making friends with someone who's already doing what you're doing. Mm. So I wanted to be a public speaker and I knew that quite a while ago. So I started to meet other people. Who else is doing this? Some of the best people I met, the people teaching public speaking, because they know about the bureaus. They know about what to look for. They know about who's getting hired and who's not. They know about what to charge, right? Uh, that's one of the things that uh, led me to to you, and um, you know, I was, I was very grateful to take your uh, your public speaking class for that reason. So the more that you can surround yourself with these mentors, um, these groups, masterminds are great for that. Um, being of service to people that that are already successful in the domain, it, having a network is totally totally massive. Also, that'd be other recommendation I have. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's interesting, Nick, I think about um, the different people I've listened to. And and it's, it's always funny to me, because I've thought, you know, find so who said who said this once, find somebody that's getting the results that you want to get and do what they do. So if you want to learn how to ride a bike, ask Lance Armstrong, you know, or somebody that's getting great results. And yet, conversely, when I think of Vegas, and having gone down there and you were down there for the hypnotist uh, conventions and the, and the different things that you went to events. Uh, but I always noticed when I was playing blackjack or one of those play, one of those games, I always got the most advice from the guy that had the least amount of chips. And so why do I want to listen to him? He's telling me, you need to do this. You should fold. You should do this. And I go, what? You don't have any chips. What, what credibility <laughs> do you have? So it's kind of funny, but so we've got, five or six minutes left. And I want to, I want to make sure we kind of let the listeners and the viewers uh, know a little bit about this. Let's talk a little bit about the actual hypnosis itself. Now this has become your, your, maybe your journey for maybe the rest of your life. Like you just said, you know, you, you don't have to necessarily know you could change again. I started in my sixties when I became a speaker after having a, a career in retail and doing different things. And so you never know, but I like that. And as you said, there's so many changes in the landscape and in the culture and all those things. But talk a little bit about that. And, and I think some of these things that you'd mentioned as a question is hypnosis safe and can anybody be hypnotized and talk a little bit about the process itself for those that may not be aware. Sure. So the biggest thing I'd want people to know is that this is not some kind of spooky mystical state and it's not mind control. Mm. At the end of the day, all hypnosis is self hypnosis. So this tends to be a voluntary act. And how do you know that's true is if we truly had the power to make anybody do anything, then there'd be no electoral processes and the world would be run by hypnotists, right? So mm -hmm. that's not the case. Um, so that's the first thing is it's very hard to, to get somebody to do something they truly don't want to do. <clears throat> now, um, the next thing is that this is not like a fantastical thing. It's in fact, an everyday experience. So when you're in a trance, you are deeply absorbed in something and you're relaxed yet focused and far more open to new ideas and suggestions that can change a person's uh, beliefs, behavior, identity. So examples of common everyday trance states would ask the listeners, have you ever been driving down the road and completely miss your freeway exit? Knowing that that sign is 12 feet high, it's not because you're be, being controlled i mean you were awake you were aware it's just say your attention was diffused on something else another example is you looking for your your watch or your keys or whatever and you know looking for your glasses and it's right there in your hand it's because your attention was uh divided there so this this is all about attention and what happens is you have a conscious mind you have a subconscious mind subconscious mind is thought to drive over 90 percent of one's behavior if you think about the, the last time that you get in a car and drive, you know, did you consciously unlock the car? Did you consciously open the door, sit in it, put the seatbelt, put the keys in the ignition, you know, checking your mirrors and the seat and all that. All the things that have that we automate to be more efficient and effective. The problem is we build um we build patterns that sometimes are unhelpful and we tend to resist change. Mm -hmm. So with hypnosis you have this this critical filter that's trying to keep us where we're at and that rejects a lot of new information a lot of new ideas in hypnosis you're so deeply relaxed and you're you're entrained to the hypnotist voice and you're following along and it feels good to do so but you're now able to take in these suggestions on a subconscious level that you normally wouldn't 
and it ends up being one of the fastest ways to change human behavior. Wow, that's that is, that is so cool too. And this is can anybody be hypnotized, Nick? Anybody can be hypnotized. Some people are definitely better at it than others. By which I mean, um, so we talked about the example of a stage show earlier. You want in that case, you'd want to find the people who are in the top five, ten percent of openness, meaning some people for whatever reason have the ability to focus very singular and very quickly. And those are people who can be you know, instantly hypnotized without any conditioning. Now, that being said, for most people, it's going to take longer so that you might have to spend 10, 20, 30 minutes getting someone into a very deep trance, or you might have to condition them over time. So the same way that you learn to do things, you can learn relaxation, you can learn hypnosis. So anybody can do it, but some will take a little bit longer than others to get there. Yeah, excellent. And you mentioned, after all, the Gratitude Guy podcast, gratitude, you mentioned that earlier, but uh, can you mention a couple other things where the whole gratitude or grateful mindset has played a role for you in your life? Sure. So I would say one of the biggest things that I'm grateful for is the challenges that I had. And um, a lot of my shortcomings led me to find solutions. And a lot of my biggest challenges, um, I ended up with the opposite of what I started with. So for example, um, having a very chaotic and um, restless mind forced me to learn relaxation, mindfulness, hypnosis, and I ended up with a more still mind. Being alone and being socially awkward forced me to learn social skills and communication. So now I end up with the opposite. I have a thriving network and I consider myself a very good communicator. Mm -hmm. um, being uh, in this, this situation of monotony and drudgery, it's, it forced me into exploring and doing new things. So I would say that, that a lot of the things that I, that I w did not want, that I felt unfortunate about myself for, ended up giving me opportunities to grow in a way that would have never been possible otherwise. So for, for that, I'm grateful for those challenges. Yeah, that's, that's excellent too. And I think, and just uh, thinking about some of the takeaways, I always mention, I mentioned at the top of the show about how the takeaways and tips and things that my guests get to have. And I, I mentioned that several I've written down that you talked about and the, I really like the no more playing it safe. I remember somebody asking this question when there's just great questions out there. And they said, you know, what would you do if you knew you had an absolute 100% chance of success? And it's like it's almost what's unlimited because it's always we're, we're fear, have this fear of failure and so forth that holds people back. But, but that no more playing it safe. And, and I love that you should know you, this idea that you're supposed to know by 18 or 20 what you're going to do the rest of your life and how that can change. And then you mentioned as well that so many changes in the laps, landscape and the culture and the millennials and the, just the way things are working when I grew up. Uh, I remember my parents or my parents' parents, my grandparents, I mean, it was, it was go to college, get a job, work there for 50 years, get a gold watch and go to the nursing home. That was the, that was the routine. And <laughs> now I think today's, they used to say we're having five and six jobs or careers or whatever. It's probably more like 10 or 12 now. So it's, it's really neat. And, but as a result of that and being aware of the changes, have some flexibility. I like that making friends along the way and finding people that are role models. I thought that was really, really good too. And so let me uh, wrap up with my last question that I always have for guests, which I just can't believe the, the gems that I've received along the way from this question. But uh, if you got to pick one thing and one thing only, What's something that Nick Gnosis, Nick Aguirre, knows today that you would have liked to know at 18 that would have helped you? Hmm. One thing that I wish I knew a lot sooner is fail. You're going to do it anyways. Fail fast. Fail often. Fail forward. And as long as you learn something from it, it's not a failure. Well, that's a great one. And I, I so agree with that, too, because we have this sort of mindset that failure is, is like you're a loser, a word I don't even like to use, or, and, but fail fast, fail often. Out of every failure is typically anywhere from one to who knows how many uh, lessons you learned. 
and you can apply that to the future and so forth. So that's really good. But I just, uh, I so appreciate you being on the show and I love your journey. It just was so neat because it was some of the transparencies that you mentioned and, and being a little bit shy or not as socially awkward or whatever, and how you went about it and got friends and became a professor. And, and then you see the show and then you decide, I think that's what I want to do almost at the time. So um, excellent, excellent, excellent. Sounds good. Well, Nick, thank you so much for being on the show and let me let the listeners and viewers know a couple of things. And just as a reminder, as I wrap up, this episode, my podcast, as I mentioned earlier, is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time in the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Uh, please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. And I do know that people are struggling with a lot of life issues, and I do have a program for that. I always want to mention to my listeners on the podcast, my gratitude coaching program will give you a coach that fully believes in you and can propel you forward to achieve anything your mind can conceive the support you receive is unmatched and getting you to believe in you and making changes you've been wanting and needing to make, whether it's your finances, your relationships, your career, or your life's journey that you want to change, and this is a good program for you. Gaining a complete understanding of your challenges, asking powerful questions, providing guidance, and a very high level of accountability, along with an attitude of gratitude, which is what I provide all combined to ensure your personal success. The six-month proprietary gratitude program is available to my podcast listeners with an additional two months free if you say you heard it on the podcast. And for more information about that, as I mentioned earlier, you can get a hold of me at thatgratitudeguy.com or david at thatgratitudeguy.com. And uh, one last thing, if you'd like to receive my Monday morning minute, I have a lot of people that enjoy getting that. It's a 60-second video that goes out every Monday morning at 6 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Go to your text and text to the number 22828. That's five digits, 22828. And in the message box, type in gratitude guy, all one word, and it'll send you a link that you can hook up and get that video every Monday morning. So thank you so much for tuning in. I always appreciate all the listeners and viewers. It makes the show complete, of course. And remember, as I always say, I'm that gratitude guy. Remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.